Our scripture for the sermon this morning is found in Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. And we'll read the first three verses. Exodus chapter 20 and verses 1 through 3. For those of you visiting, we have been uh, just getting started with a series of sermons through the Ten Commandments. And I'm kind of slow, so it's taken four weeks to get to the first commandment. So here we go. Exodus chapter 20 and verses 1 through 3. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. So when we started this series on the Ten Commandments, I warned that this could be kind of tough because the law of God shows us our sin. And so we had to have to be prepared to be shown our sin. Not so that we can be left in our sins, but so that we can confess and find forgiveness. But even though at the end there's joy in that, there's confession and forgiveness, nonetheless the process can be challenging because we don't like to be shown our sin. We prefer uh, many times, I know I would prefer not to be. I like for folks to tell me what a good guy I am. And the law of God tells me that, well, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner in need of a savior. But having said that, when we first come to the first commandment, we might be tempted to say, well, good, I can take this week off because it's about not being an idolater and I know that I've gotten that one under control. I'm not an idolater. After all, we've all gathered in a Christian church, and a, in a Christian church at that that has confessional commitments that are based on the authority of the Bible. And so in terms of the Old Testament, we're Christians. We're not Baal worshipers. We don't, uh, we don't come worshiping any of those pagan deities that the Israelites had experienced in Egypt or that they would experience in Canaan, not our problem. And in terms of the New Testament, we are not worshipers of any of the gods that they uh, had in the Rome, days of the Roman Empire, uh, none of the mystery religions that were kind of the fad of the day. Those, again, are not our problem. We're not those kind of people. We're Christians. We have gathered in a Christian church. And if we were to think about it in modern terms, again, we're Christians. We're not Muslims or Hindus or Buddhists or any of those other religions. We're Christians, so we're not pagans. We're not idolaters. And so when the Bible says, you shall have no other gods before me, got that one. That's under control. Now, some of us, most of us probably, have been taught over the years that the commandment's somewhat broader than that. And so even um, things that are not self-consciously religious commitments, but it, with regard to any area of life, if there are things in our lives, even things that on their own are good things, but if we give them first place ahead of God, then they become our God. And so that's a, a form of idolatry. And so there are even good things, things like our families, our uh, the work that we do, our hobbies and interests. All these things on their own are, are good things. They are, in fact, gifts of God. Our families are God's gifts. The work that we do uh, to make a living, that's God's gift to us. Our hobbies, the things that we enjoy in life, again, are things that God has given to us for our enjoyment. And yet even those good things, if they take over first place in our lives, if we are absorbed in them in a way that they become uh, our priority, our uh, chief interest in living, then those become idols. They actually take the place of God in our minds and hearts. And so we've been taught that this commandment, in that sense, can be broader than we typically think about. And yet I want to suggest that the commandment's even more broad than that. 
In fact, I will suggest to you that any time we violate commandments 2 through 10, so whether it's making an idol, uh, as in uh, the second commandment, or uh, stealing, or adultery, or murder, or in all the applications and implications of those commandments, whenever uh, coveting, whenever we break any of the other nine commandments, Every one of those nine also amounts to a breaking of the first commandment. Because when we sin in any sense, essentially we are saying that we know that we have a choice between God's way or the highway, God's way or my way, and to sin is to choose my way rather than God's way. And so in that sense, there's kind of a double jeopardy involved. Anytime we break other commandments, we are doing so because we have decided that someone else, usually myself, is God instead of the real God. I'm choosing my way, what I want to do, instead of what I know God has commanded me. Certainly that was the choice that was presented to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The serpent said, did, did God really say? And then when, Adam and Eve, when Eve responded, and then later Adam partook of the forbidden fruit, when, after the serpent had said, did God really say, he then said, God was wrong. I have something better for you. And so they chose the serpent, an idol, instead of God. They took sides with Satan instead of God. And so the same is involved with every human sin. When we sin... It's, in effect, an act of idolatry. So we sin by hating, we sin by coveting, we sin by lying. But in all of those instances, those sins also involve an abandoning of the true and the living God because we decide that we want what we want. And so um, all sin, the violation of any of the commandments, is basically a violation of the first commandment as well. And so now we are starting to raise the bar pretty high, aren't we? Get your pole out, the pole vault over it. I want to suggest that there's even more to talk about here that shows us our sin with regard to the first commandment. So Actually, we will spend two Sundays on this commandment. Next Sunday, we will talk about idolatry. But this Sunday, today, we're going to talk about something that comes first, something that we typically overlook. We run straight for the idols, the other gods, and we forget that there's something else that's preliminary that actually is reflected very well in the portion of the larger catechism that we read earlier, but, but that frequently we overlook in our thinking about the first commandment. And so again, in verse 3, we see, our pos we see what I'm going to call a positive duty. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. And we see a negative there. No other gods, no idols, no false gods, no fake gods, no fraudulent gods. But even though the words before me come last in that sentence, it could be argued that those words are essential to understanding any of the sentence. Because to say that we can have no other gods before the true God requires that, in fact, that the true God has to be worshipped first. The true God has to be uh, first in our affections, in our worship, in our desires, in order for everything else to fall someplace later. If we say that we are to worship God preeminently, we cannot do that unless we worship God. And then we say we worship Him preeminently. And so the worship of God, our affection toward God, our obedience to God, our interest in God is a positive fundamental that we must recognize before we recognize, well, that worship of God must come first. 
We worship God. We recognize Him. We know who He is. And then we recognize that 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 must come first. So let me illustrate in this way. All of us understand the difference between real money and monopoly money. (laughs) Fake money. Usually if you go to the store and you get up to the cashier, they expect to get the real stuff. They don't expect, if you hand out, if you pass out monopoly money, they're going to look at you like you're crazy because they don't take monopoly money for goods and services. They expect real money. So in the same way, the command that we worship God, that we not worship other gods, requires that we understand that the other gods are frauds. They are like monopoly money. They are fake in the same way. And so in order to really get this, we not only have to understand who the fake gods are, but more importantly even, it's important that we recognize that God, the true and the living God, the God of Scripture, is distinct from the fake ones. And so we can't just avoid the fakes and say, well, I'm not going to bring any more monopoly money to the store. But we also must worship the one who is real. We must understand, in terms of my illustration, what real cash is. And we must make sure that we are worshiping the real God. And then we make sure that he is coming first. And so we've seen a positive duty. But second, I would have you to notice that this is a preeminent duty And in order to understand it, we have to put verse 3 in light of verses 1 and 2. Because when God says, you shall have no other gods before me, he clearly was assuming or requiring that they understand who me is. And so that's identified in verses 1 and 2. God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt after out of the house of slavery and so they weren't to worship the gods they had left behind in egypt they weren't going to worship the gods that they would encounter in canaan when they got there but rather they were to worship the god who had delivered them out of the land of egypt they were not free to select a god of their own who would fit what they wanted to do and who they wanted to be but they were to worship the God who had revealed himself to to them and who had revealed himself in Scripture through the words of Moses, but had also revealed himself to them in his mighty uh, efforts or acts of redemption by which he had brought them out of Egypt. And so they were to worship the God who is real, the one who had made himself known to them both by his words and also by his mighty acts. That is the one that was to have first place in their, li- in their lives and no other gods were to compete with them. So who is this God? Well, he's identified in these first two verses. If we were to think about it more broadly, we could think that he's identified himself in everything that Moses has written to this point. So through all of the book of Genesis, and through the first 19 chapters of the book of Exodus. And so the God that they were to worship first, the one before whom nobody else could stand or nothing else could stand, is the one in Genesis 1 and 2 who is the creator of all things. He's the one who is the judge of sin, as we see in Genesis 3 and in the account of the flood. He is the one who called Abraham out of paganism and made him his own by his grace through faith in Genesis 12 and and forward. He is the one who changed the sinful attitudes of Jacob and made him more like his child. He is the God who providentially saved his people through making Joseph prime minister of Egypt and delivering the Israelites from famine and drought. And he is the God who delivered them, we have seen in Exodus out of the house of slavery in Egypt. And so that God, the mighty creator and the mighty redeemer, the mighty creator, the mighty judge, the mighty creator and the mighty savior, that is the one 
that was the true God and no other gods were to be placed before him. I should add that we've seen that in Genesis and Exodus, but for our purposes, having the rest of the Bible, we should know more. He is the one who is the triune God, who in the person of the Son took on humanity and was made like us except for sin. He is the one who died on the cross making payment for our sin and who then rose from the dead. He is the one who is the head of the church and who promised that the gates of hell would not uh, prevail against it. He is the one who has promised to come again in power and glory and bring all things to consummation in accordance with his will. That is the one whom we are to worship and before whom no one or no thing can come uh, ahead of him. He is the God who has revealed himself in the pages of Scripture, making himself known to us. What is our source of knowledge about this God? Is it that by reason we can rise up and figure out who he is because we have mentally raised ourselves to heaven? No. Is it because we can empirically uh, investigate and find him within things that exist? No. All of those can provide clues, but fundamentally we know who God is because he has revealed himself to us in his word. And we find God in his word, and then we look around and we see that his word is true. It is a faithful and accurate presentation of who God is. And so we've seen a positive duty. We've seen a preeminent duty. But thirdly, third, I would have you to notice that often there is a purposeful denial. People, even those within churches sometimes, deny this sort of God and thereby we, we violate this positive command. So how do we do that? What are the sins that even God's people can commit against this command. It, it, it's very easy to point outside the church and say, well, there's those, those atheists or people from other religions or people that don't uh, bother with the Bible or church. It, it, it's easy to say those, those people out there violate this commandment, but how do we violate this commandment? What are the sins that we commit that we sometimes have to repent of? Well, let me just mention a few. Many Christians, I would dare say many of us at times, have ignored the real God by denying aspects of his character that make us uncomfortable, thus making him someone other than he is by denying his perfect holiness in order to make him out to be more amenable to what we want. And so it's very easy to think, well, I'm glad God's a redeemer. I'm glad that he loves me. But all of this stuff about his holiness and being the judge, I don't care for that. And if he's the judge, he, he, he judges those bad guys out there. He doesn't come passing judgment on someone like me. And so ignore, uh, and, and certainly there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So, if we're believers, we don't have to fear hell. And yet the Bible does say that whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And so there is a kind of judgment that comes when we ignore his commandments. It's not a final judgment, but the judgment of a fire that prunes out uh, dross and that leaves what is better. But there is a tendency to think, well, God understands this. God's not going to be too hard on me for that. God will ignore this other thing. After all, I'm better than Susan is. Or I'm better, let me jump over here. I'm better than Justin is. I've got to give some fair, uh, fairness. I, usually I pick on the colliers, so I'm trying to find somebody else. 
But it's, you know, it, it's easy to say, well, as long, uh, you know, I'm not, God's not too hard on that sort of thing. And so we make him out to be different than what he really is. We, we don't recognize him as pure in his holiness, as perfect in his righteousness. We make him out to be less. Or perhaps there are other characteristics of him that make us uncomfortable. Because God is omnipresent, he's everywhere. That means I never go any place and escape the presence of God. Everywhere I go. The psalmist said, if I descend to the hell, you're there. Everywhere I go, God's there. That can be a source of great comfort. Every place I go, even if I'm surrounded by enemies, God is there with me. He was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the midst of the fire. And so everywhere I go, God is with me. That can be a source of great comfort. And yet for some, it's a source of discomfort. There's no place I go and escape, where I, I, and escape the presence of God. And so that's a source of discomfort. That's the reason that the French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre refused to believe in God. He said the idea that I'm an object that he sees all the time. I don't like that. And so he rejected God because it was not comfortable to him. It was uncomfortable uh, to him. And so we make, uh, many of us don't reject God entirely like Sartre did. He was an atheist, but uh, some of us reduce God to less than he really is because um, it makes us uncomfortable, and that's a way of denying the first commandment. We we'll make God out to be a different sort of God. Another way that we can deny God and violate the first commandment is to reduce him to a tool for whatever it is we want to get out of him. And so we don't exist for the glory of God, but God exists for us. And so whatever doesn't suit our purposes, we deny. And so there's a way that some Christians have of making God to be the nail that fits our hammer. Um, and so we, we make him to be only what we think we need. And so... If we want a counselor, then we talk about God as a therapist. If we want advice, we talk about God as a life coach. If we want a friend, he becomes our buddy. If he want, we want him to fix the politics of the nations, he becomes a political philosopher. If we have particular hobby horses, we want him to address those and fix them, and we're happy when the preacher talks about them, but why is he talking about this other stuff? And so we see God in all these other ways, but when we do that, do we see him ultimately as the great God of glory and this great Savior of sinners? Do we see him manifesting all the qualities and characteristics that are described of him in Scripture? God is greater than our attempts to reduce him to something else. And we violate the first commandment when we try to reduce him to something else. The other way that I'll mention that we violate the first commandment is when we fail to make use of his means of grace to show us who he is. And so when we first come to faith in Christ or when we grow up in Christian homes, obviously our understanding of scripture is limited. But the expectation is that through God's means of grace, that is through our Bible reading, through our prayer, through our church attendance, through our partaking of the sacraments, that through all these means that God shows us more about who he is. And so we, we learn more of him and we, we grow in the knowledge of him. And yet often we can be guilty of not uh, taking advantage of those means of grace. And again, I could talk about people that aren't here and say, well, think about all those people that skip out on church and don't come, but they're not here today, so I won't talk about them. But there are other means of grace that many Christians who do attend church nonetheless fail to take advantage of. I heard of a pastor one time that did something that was really mean. If I ever come to your house, I promise not to do this. But he knocked on the door of home 
And as he, as somebody was coming to answer the door, he heard scurrying around inside. And so he came in, they welcomed him in, he sat down with them in the living room and placed prominently on the coffee table in the center of the room, there was a family Bible. And the preacher being a mean sort, looked down, took his finger and wiped through the dust on the top of the Bible. Mean. I would never do something like that. <laughs> but you get the point, don't you? We have our Bibles. Are we beavers to make sure that we, want, we understand them? I mean, do we have this eagerness to read Scripture and to understand it and to find out not just stories that will interest us, but find out who really God is as He's revealed Himself? In Scripture, we violate the first commandment when we fail to take advantage of the means that He's given us to better understand Him. And so we've seen um, our positive duty. We've seen the um, the um, pre our preeminent deity. We've seen the purposeful denial. Finally, I would have you to notice that we have a pardoning deity. And so this is the good news. And I hope that I will do that over the next many weeks as we talk about this, the Ten Commandments. But as a Christian church and as a Christian minister, it's my job never to preach law and stop there. Because if we preach law and stop there, then I've done nothing more than leave you in your sins. And that would be a grave sin on the part of the church and a grave sin on the part of me. And so when we read the Ten Commandments and we understand all of their implications, all that they take in in these few words, it's easy for us, whether it's something I've specifically talked about this morning or something that I've not even mentioned, but you're aware of it as we talk about the various implications of the Ten Commandments, it's very possible for all of us to see Oh, I sin. I, God's not first in my life. I neglect Him. I don't try as much as I should to know who He really is that I might worship Him. And so we see our sin. But I would remind you that as we see our sin, the scriptural promise, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We mentioned earlier that God called Paul, or not Paul, but Abraham, out of paganism. You know, it's easy to get the wrong idea that, you know, God was looking down on the earth and he saw down in Ur of the Chaldees this one guy that in the midst of all this uh, depravity and idolatry, this one guy that was the one good guy, and God said, I'll take him. That's not what happened. Abraham was a pagan too. And actually among Abraham's descendants, we read through Genesis, we even, I was reading this past week in, in 1 and 2 Samuel about um, David. And when David was trying to hide from King Saul and, and he had, was married to Saul's daughter uh, Michael and and they were trying to figure out how to hide David and Michael. That they came up with the plan that they would get one of the idols and dress it up in a wig and put it under the, the bed blanket and make it look like David was lying there in bed. You know why they were able to do that? Because they had an idol in their home. So God called Abram out of idolatry to himself. God called David and refers to him as a man after his own heart. And he says, David, and we know that David was an ancestor of the Messiah, of Jesus. And we find all through the Old Testament, as well as the New, God calling sinners to himself and not making them perfect people. Now that they're in heaven, they're perfect, right? But they weren't perfect. They were sinners in need of a graceful 
and gracious God. And none of that is a reason to just remain in our sins. I mean, part of the purpose of all this is to call us out of our sin and call us to greater faithfulness as we grow in the grace of God over the course of our lives. And so this isn't an excuse for our sins, but when we recognize our sin, we realize that all through the Bible, that God forgives the sins even of idolaters, even of those that violate the first commandment. And of that, we ought to be glad because we're all sinners. And so as I've gone through this, it's occurred to me that I used to, I used to hear this in churches I preached at decades ago. I don't, I don't recall ever hearing it here. So if, you, if you've said this, you did it out of my presence and good for you. But sometimes I've, in the past, I've heard, I've preached sermons and as people were going by me as they left, they said, Harry, I'm, I'm so glad you preached this sermon. I just wish Joe had been here to hear it. <laughs> and if you said that, shame on you. <laughs> because actually, God brings his word for those of us that are here. And we might wish for help for those that have other needs. But the real thing that we ought to think about is, and I had to think about as I was preparing it as well as when I preach it, is how does this apply to me? Where have I sinned? And where do I need to seek God's forgiveness? And when we seek God's forgiveness, we then in turn find it because he is a gracious God. The wonderful reality is that the God who is so mighty that he spoke the worlds into existence is also so mighty that he can deliver the vilest offender from his sins. The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. And what was true in that hymn is true for us as we confess.